Thanks, Brad. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you today. I have to tell you, um, this is the sixth time that I've um, given an executive lecture here at UBU. And I asked Brad, I said, aren't, aren't they tired of me? And he very graciously said, no, you're one of our, uh, uh, one of the speakers that they love the most. So hopefully I will not let you down um, today. Um, for those of you who have heard me or know me, um, typically um, I start every lecture with a Jewish joke. Now let me tell you why. I grew up in a Jewish family in Southern California. My uncle was probably the most famous Jewish comedian in the United States of anyone, a fellow by the name of Myron Cohen. I would invite you to Google him. Um, he was a frequent guest on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and he used to crack Johnny up with all of his um, Jewish stories. Well, he used to come to our home um, for family parties, and I, would, I grew up hearing all of these stories, and they're just ingrained in my head. So I'm going to start today by sharing one of my most favorite with you. Now, I can do not only the joke, but I can do the Yiddish accent that comes with it. And if you know anything about Yiddish, that's a combination of German and Hebrew, and it's a specific accent. So here, here is the joke. So <clears throat> Morris and Esther, married couple, been married for years, devoted to one another, and Esther goes to the doctor for a physical. And the doctor says to her that he will call her at home that evening with the results of her physical exam. So she and Morris are in the kitchen eating dinner. The telephone rings. She gets up, goes out into the living room to answer the phone, closes the door behind her, and Morris hears her through the closed kitchen door say, oh my gosh, doctor, you've got to be kidding. You can be serious. What does this mean? I've never heard of this before. What am I going to do? And Morris hears her slam the phone down, and he comes running in, and he says, honey, what's the matter? And she says, Morris, that was the doctor with the results of my exam. He tells me I've got hypies. What in the world is hypies? I've never heard of it before. Morris says, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Not the boy. Pulls a dictionary down from the shelf. Opens it up, thumbs through to the H's, looks for a moment, turns to Esther and says, honey, you got nothing to boy about. Says right here in the dictionary, hypies is the disease of the Gentiles. Hope I don't have to explain that um, to anybody. All right. Also, I want to tell you, we're going to be talking today about a subject that should be incredibly important to you. It's the importance of networking. I'm going to start by sharing two quotes with you. One, I know you know the answer to, and I'm at, or you've heard it before, and I'm actually going to ask you in unison to end the quote. The other one you may have not heard. Here's the, the one that you may not have heard. The quote is this, never underestimate the value of real human interaction. The other quote you know well. It starts this way, and you finish it for me. It's not what you know, it's who you know, all right? That is truer today than it ever has been in history. Absolutely critical. Now, there's a definition of networking, and it's an interesting definition. The definition is that networking is what you do when you're not, not looking for a job. 
That's networking. It's what you do when you're not looking for a job. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on the social network because obviously you all know how important that is. I kind of wish they had that when I was your age, but they didn't. So things like um, LinkedIn, Facebook, I know you know all how to use that, so I'm not going to talk about that. But I am going to, to share with you some other ideas that maybe you haven't thought of before. The first is using what I call emotional labor. Emotional labor. What do I mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. You need to be going to events in your city, wherever that may be. They may be conferences, they may be meetings, they may be mixers, or anything at all that will expose you to people of influence, all right? Volunteer to be on local boards. I cannot overemphasize the importance of that. Now, you hear me say that, and you may be sitting in your seats thinking to yourself, I'm way too young. Nobody will want me on a volunteer board. That is the furthest thing from the truth. I guarantee you that if you were to go down to City Hall here in Provo or in Orem and volunteer to be on a local board, they would take you within one minute of you offering, all right? They're crying for people that are willing to volunteer without expecting to get anything in return. It's critical that you do that, all right? And when you get on those boards, you're gonna meet people of influence, all right? It's a great way to network. Let me share with you a personal experience. By a show of hands, how many of you know the name Eric Schmidt? Nobody? Well, I see one hand in the back. Anybody else? Now, I find that hard to believe. But let me tell you about Eric Schmidt. Eric Schmidt was the head of Novell here in Utah County. He left Novell to become president of a small little company that never amounted to very much in Silicon Valley. Uh, it was called Google, okay? Probably never heard of Google, have you? <clears throat> anyway, um, Eric and I served on several boards together here locally. That's where I got to meet him and know him. And he and I and our wives did things socially together. So he leaves Novell and he goes to Google. Google at the time was a privately held company. One day he called me, and this was in the year 2005. He said, Jeff, what server do you use? And I said, I'm a Yahoo guy. And Yahoo was the big deal back then. He said, have you ever used Google? I said, no. He said, well, you probably, because you're in the world of finance, know that Google's going public. I said, yeah, I've heard that. He said, I want you to get on the website and use it, and then call me. So I did, and called him back, and he said, what do you think? And I said, that's I still like Yahoo better, all right? And he said, well, you know Google's going public. Yes. He said, um, they've just announced the um, offering price, the price that it goes out at when it goes public. And I said, oh, what's that? And he said, it's going to go out at $85 a share. He said, the two young owners of Google have big plans 
for Google. That's all he said. Big plans. And then he said, if I were you, I'd bet the farm on Google. I'd put as much money into it as you possibly can. Well, at the time, I didn't have any money to put into it, all right? It was all tied up in other investments. And the only place I could get any money was from my home equity line. So I learned this very early on in my marriage. I never make a business decision without talking to my wife first. I don't always listen to her, but I always talk to her first. So I, and she knew Eric, so I told her and um, she said, well, isn't this awfully risky? A new startup company? And I said, yeah, it's really risky. She said, well, where are you gonna get the money from? And I said, well, I only have one place right now, and that's our home equity line. She said, well, what happens if it fails? And you'd have to know me, Brett, or Brad knows my sense of humor. I just looked at her and said, well, we might have to live in our car for a couple of years, but other than that, it won't be anything serious. And she just kind of rolled her eyes at me. She's always been very supportive, and she said, okay, if you want to do this, go ahead. I borrowed every cent that I could from our home equity line, which was considerable. On the day Google went public, it went out at $85 a share. I didn't get it at 85, I got it at $87 a share. And I haven't looked back ever since, all right? Um, it split several times, it's now in the mid $700 a share. And um, let's put it this way, it's kept the wolves away from the door for a long, long time, all right? And I expect it to do that for a, a very long time in the future. But that would have never happened had I not met Eric Schmidt on this volunteer board, okay? All right, next thing, collect business cards. And if you're feeling adventuresome, hand out your own. Now, I, <laughs> I remember this very clearly. I created a business card for myself when I was eight years old. And I had my name, my address, and my phone number on it. I'm not exactly sure what I expected when I handed it out to people, you know, somebody would say to an eight-year-old, oh, Mr. Khan, we'd love to have you come and be CEO of our company, you know. Um, I just knew it was the right thing to do, to start getting me out there, even that young, at eight years of age, okay? Now, here on the stage is a box of my current business cards. All of my contact information is on the back. Much more sophisticated than the thing I handed out to people when I was eight years old. But the point is this, I would hope that you might come down, each of you, and take one of those business cards. Because what I'm about to say to you is very, very honest. I'm not blowing smoke. If I can help any of you in any way, all you've got to do is contact me. Remind me where you met me, because I meet so many people every day, I won't, um, I won't remember, but if you say executive lecture where you talked about networking, that'll be great. But I will help you in any way that I possibly can. There's not a new person that I ever meet that the first thing I don't do is hand a bus my business card to them, always, always. So I would hope that you would consider that. All right, next, find a mentor. I've had many mentors in my life. Um, probably the most influential, and he's still a mentor of mine. He's 92 years old. 
His name is Leia Coca. And have you heard of him? Uh, a few more hands. Leia Coca, um, I met him in my early 30s. And he became a mentor of mine. Um, he was the man in the 70s that turned Chrysler Corporation around. They were about to go under. He was very, uh, very well thought of as uh, a businessman for Ford, and Chrysler um, stole him away, and he turned that, he saved that company, literally. Well, he's been a mentor of mine, and several other people have for years and years. Having a mentor is extremely important. Now, let me tell you an experience I had with a mentee. I mentor students here at UVU all the time. And this was a few years ago. I had a young woman by the name of Trisha that I was mentoring. Trisha was an amazing young woman. woman. Besides being extremely beautiful, with a great sense of humor, very articulate, she was an entrepreneur. She called me one day and she said, Jeff, I'd like to take you to lunch. I have this product I'd like to show you. She said, I don't know how to get it patented and I don't know how to get it marketed and I'd like you to help me. Great. So. I met with her, and like I said, she had a great sense of humor. This is how the conversation went. She said, um, <clears throat> do you know when you go into a public restroom, they have that metal container on the wall that has those paper sheets that you pull out and you put on the toilet seat to cover the toilet seat? I said, yeah. She said, I don't like those because she said they never stay on the seat. I sit down and I move around and I'm, my, my keister is touching the, the toilet seat and other people have been there, I don't like that. And then she said, you know the flap that hangs down that you're supposed to push the, the uh, cover into the toilet bowl? She said, then she had a funny line, she said, guy, that doesn't bother guys. They don't mind sticking their whole hand in the toilet bowl. But she said, we ladies don't like that. She said, I don't like to touch that thing after I've, I've used the facility. So here's what she had invented. She had taken one of those um, toilet seat covers and she put sticky tape around the bottom. Very simple. And remember, in entrepreneurship, it's always the simplest ideas that make the most money. But here's what she'd also done. She'd removed that flap and she'd replaced it with a weighted flap that was um, biodegradable so that when you got up, there was enough weight to, to just pull that whole thing into the toilet bowl and it dissolved because it was biodegradable. I thought it was a pretty amazing idea. So I got her to a patent attorney. Um, he charged her $2,500 or $2, for the patent. Sorry about that. $2,500. And then I got her to an executive friend of mine at Bristol Myers Squibb. They bought the idea from her for $3.1 million, okay? $3.1 million. I manage that money today, all right? Now, here's the point. You've never seen that product anywhere. That's not why Bristol Myers bought it. Why did they buy it? So, they, so no one else, they bought the patent, so no one else could come out with it, okay? That same girl, two years later, right before the 4th of July, called me and said, what are you doing, Jeff? And I said, oh, my wife and I, and she knew my wife, we're sitting here on the deck just kind of relaxing. She said, I've got a new product. Could I come over and show it to you in Charlene? 
I said, yeah. So she comes over and she's got a cooler. And out of the cooler, she takes what looks to be like a fudge sickle. And it's, it's all wrapped and it has a label on it and it's called Glacier. And she again starts her pitch. Now, she knew I'd been a power lifter um, most of my life. And she said, um, do you take protein? And I said, yes. She said, what is it about protein you don't like? I said, the aftertaste. She said, exactly. Try this. She had three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and cookies and cream. It tasted just like a fudge sickle. And I said, what is this? She said, it's a protein bar. But she said, I have removed the aftertaste of the protein, okay, and I've taken all of the sugar out of it. It was delicious. And she said, I need to get this to market, but I don't know how to do it. Well, she said, do you have any ideas? I said, um, well, I happen to know the owner of a local market here called Day's Market in Provo. And there's one in Heber also. So I got them hooked t together, and he had all his employees try this bar. And they loved it. So he said, I'm going to let you on um, 4th of July sell this product in the store. Let's see how it goes. Well, she sold out in less than an hour, okay? So then she came to me and she said, um, I need to find a place to mass produce this because right now I'm doing it out of my home. Well, at the time, I was chairing the advisory board here at UVU for the culinary arts program. And that, the chairman of that program was a fellow by the name of Peter Sproul. Peter Sproul also owned a local restaurant here in, uh, just down the Orem Hill. And so I got him and, uh, he and um, uh, Tricia together and he let her use the kitchen at his restaurant. She produced this, and then I got her involved with Whole Foods. And now, it's all over the country. When you go to Whole Foods, you can buy it, and she has her own kitchen facility, warehouse, and everything, all right? That kind of thing doesn't happen without a mentor. It doesn't. All right. Next, direct community service. Notice that I use the word direct. Why do I use that word? I am talking about tutor, things like tutoring inner city kids, working in a homeless shelter, reading to the blind, befriending people in need, connecting with the lives and needs of people with limited economic means. Now, admittedly, this is not always a comfortable activity, all right? But the reasons for doing this should be obvious, I hope, to you. As we progress in our professional lives, it's very easy to lose touch with the lives of ordinary people. Instead of becoming more compassionate over time, our hearts can become hardened, all right? Let me tell you again a personal story. When I was starting out in the business world, I was struggling. And I was only interested in two things, money and power. I had never given service to anyone, anyone at all. I was totally consumed with myself and with money and power. Lee Iacocca, 
came to my rescue. And he gave me some very good counsel that I've tried to pattern my life after. He said, this is a direct quote, a businessman or businesswoman devoted to service without expecting compensation will have only one thing to worry about with his or her profits, P-R-O-F-I-T-S. They will be embarrassingly large. And in my life, I have found that to be true. I don't worry about money. I worry more about providing quality service and helping people who need help. That's why I love working with the students here at UVU. My goal is to help you any way that I possibly can. All right, be persistent. Keep bothering people until they respond to you. Now, I want you to picture me as a very young man. I weighed 130 pounds. I was a twig. I was a good surfer, because I only lived 18 blocks from the, the beach. My mother was actually amazed that I graduated um, from high school, because I spent most of my time surfing. But that's not what I wanted. What I wanted was to be an athlete. I wanted that more than anything else in the world. And yet, I was the person in intramural sports where the captain of the two teams said, you take Jeff. No, you take him. No, you take him. No, you take him. Well, somebody's got to take him. Come on, all right? I was always the last chosen because I was not good at team sports at all. I did make the high school basketball team Never played one second. Never got in a game at all, all right? So, picture how I looked, skinny runt. I'm surfing one day, I'm done surfing, and I'm walking down the beach. And I come to a beach called Venice Beach. Now, Venice Beach in my day had another name. It was called Muscle Beach. And all of the bodybuilders and the power lifters used to lift out on the beach. And all the weights were there and the benches and the mirrors and everything. And they're posing. And, and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, you know, with some training, I could do this. I could do this. Because a team's not relying on me. It's just me setting goals for myself and trying to achieve those goals. And I've always been a goal setter. So I look over, and I, I see these three guys working out. And they're, they're enormous, huge. They could have eaten me in one or two bites. Unbelievable. So I go over to one of the guys. The other two kind of walked away. And this guy was lifting, bench pressing, an incredible amount of weight. And I said, excuse me. And he kind of looked at me like, yeah, what do you want, kid? And I said, I wonder if you'd be interested in training me. And he just looked at me and then looked away. Well, as I said, I was persistent. Always have been, always will be. If I want something, I go after it. And I don't stop till I get it. And so I kept at him, kept at him. And he was about, he was about to swat me away like a fly. And one of the other guys walked over and said to him, you know what, this kid is pretty persistent. Why don't we train him? And the one that I'd been talking to goes, oh, all right, if you think so. So those three guys trained me. Their names, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Lou Ferrigno, Franco Colombo. You may not know the Colombo name. Colombo had the largest shoulders I've ever seen 
on anybody. They train me, and Schwarzenegger and Ferrigno have remained friends of mine to this day. But they trained me so well that I got bigger, stronger, not a poser, a power lifter. And I've competed all over the country. The last time I competed nationally, I was 58 years old. I'm 73 now, and I took sixth in the nation in my division. I was very happy about that. But persistence, you gotta be persistent to get what you want. All right, next. Those people who become successful keep their virtual Rolodex moving all the time. Now, you may be too young to know the term Rolodex. Do you know what that is? Yeah, it's, a, it's a, a holder for business cards, and it goes around like that. You guys all use your cell phones and your computers today. In my day, we used a Rolodex, okay? These are people who know enough about others to spot something of interest to them, and they ask for key introductions. They're called connectors. Connectors are the go-to people, the must-haves at the meetings. Their effects are viral. The more they connect, the more connections come to them. I would be someone who is a connector, all right? People, and I don't say this to be self-serving, so, but people want me to be at their meetings, all right? Okay, now, let me say one last thing to you. Whatever career choice you make, please never underestimate the power of the right attitude. The right attitude is what causes a person to rise or fall in life. It's what can take a person from being a cancer patient to a cancer survivor. It's what can get you the sale. It's what can build the relationship. It's what can overcome challenges and maximize your life. Let me tell you, I am bombarded with resumes all the time. Very seldom do I look at any of them. I might glance at them. Why? Because I already know two things. If you're going to come to me for a job, I expect that you'll know about what I do for a living, and I also expect that you will have the necessary education and skills to do the job. All right, and I also know if you don't have all the skills, I can teach them to you. But the one thing that'll make someone stand out from the crowd, the one thing that I can't tell from a resume is the right attitude. Skills are a necessity but we'll, what will make those skills work more effectively and serve you better is the right attitude. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. I do two things when I'm about to hire somebody. The first is I give them a quick test. Somebody here want to volunteer for a quick test? Show of hands. Stand up. Okay. You're with me interviewing for a job. I'm going to give you this quick test, and 
I want you to respond. Now, you cannot respond by asking me any questions. You gotta figure it out and just tell me what you do, all right? Here it is. You have been shrunk to a size of a pencil and put in a blender. How do you get out? Let's go, come on. Too slow, come on. Okay, all right. That's good. You can sit down. Well, we'll see. There's another test. Okay. Obviously, that's a stupid thing for me to ask, right? Silly. Can I tell you the number of people, when I ask that question, that do this? I don't know. Am I going to hire that person? No. No way. What am I looking for when I ask that question? What am I looking for? Well, one thing certainly is creativity. Okay? He was fairly creative. <laughs> no, fairly creative. <laughs> but what else am I looking for? Problem solving. What else? It's, it's a stupid thing for me to ask. So what do I want to see? Can he, can he deal with it how? Exactly. Is he going to have some fun with it? Is he going to realize how stupid it is? Is he going to laugh a little bit about it? Does he have a sense of humor? For me, sense of humor is extremely important. Okay, so he's gotten through it, all right? And I'm, I'm almost ready to hire him, okay? I just have to ask him how much money he's going to pay me to get the job. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I want to give him one more test. So I invite him out to breakfast. We're going to go to Mimi's Cafe in Orem. I tell him we're going to meet there at 8 o'clock. I show up, 7.45. I go into the restaurant. I find the server that's going to be serving us. I, it's usually a woman. I tell her, I'm going to be meeting in a few minutes with a young man. I said, I would say, um, whatever he orders, whatever it is, I want you to bring him the wrong order. I don't care what it is. Just bring him the wrong order. Don't worry, I'll pay for the breakfast, and if you do this well, I'll give you a very nice tip also. So he comes, stand up again. He comes, puts in his order, server brings him the wrong order, and he responds. How do you respond? Excellent. Sit down. Okay? That's exactly the response I'm looking for. Now, he could have responded in two other ways. He could have said nothing and just eaten what was put in front of him. Am I going to hire him? Why not? How does, that, how does that response translate to his work? Yeah, mediocre is okay, please. He's absolutely non-confrontational, and in the workplace, um, you have to do it the right way, but it's very, very important, okay? So he could have responded that way. He also could have gotten upset and said, hey, I told you a different order. Now what? get your head together and bring me out the right order. Would I hire him then? Why not? It's too confrontational, all right? He gets angry very easily. It's not the kind of person I'm looking for either. So those are two tests that I give to potential employees. Shows their attitude. Now, 
Let me just close by telling you this. Having a positive attitude is not going to take away the challenges of the world or what you encounter personally. What a healthy and positive attitude will do is to empower you to deal with challenges and situations in a more effective and a healthier way. The right attitude is going to lead you to the right meanings, perceptions, and solutions that would not otherwise come if you had a negative or a defeatist attitude. It's good to be with you. Please come and take a business card. Thank you very much.